All right. Well, I don't really want to make this a part three. Uh, we have um, not much time left now. So I'm going to dive right in here. Who was, who was with us last week? Or who missed last week? Well, put it this way. Don't, don't put your hand up. If you missed last week, and uh, uh, this is part two of a, of a little mini-series I'm doing called Loving the Bride of Christ. And as I said last week, I was taking a drive. It was probably about two months, maybe three months ago. I was driving somewhere, listening to a friend of mine from Australia, uh, listening to his a message he had done on a Sunday at his, in, his, in his church that him and his wife lead. And uh, it's called Loving the Christ. And it's going it's to keep cutting out there. Always you have to move that thing, bro. And uh, um, and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a phenomenal message. And I thought, you know what? I want to preach that in the life of the church. I want to I want to preach this into grace life. And so I listened to it a few times. Uh, there was basically three. Well, he's got four points. I've cut it down to three. Uh, the fourth point, I could I kind of you know I want to preach in it some other time. And uh, so the first one, and if I want to encourage you, please go to our YouTube page. We have a YouTube channel, and uh, we're going to start doing the MP3 soon, converting them to have put all our audios together. But please go to the the uh, um, YouTube page and go and upload or download or listen to all the messages that we put up. If you have an Android phone or iOS and Apple, uh, um, an iPhone, you can also, we've got an app, eDisciples app, download that and look at all our stuff there. We put up all the different things that we're going to be doing. The playlists of the preachers are up there, the, the, the YouTube ones, you can actually just click on that and watch it straight from your phone without going onto YouTube. All right, so I want to encourage you to do that. And so last week's one, I spent some time talking about the two points. Uh, if you want to just put them up there, thanks. Do I have them? No, I don't. It's the scripture first. I don't want about it. But it was loving those we, d- we know in the body of Christ. It's out of Hebrews 13. Let's read Hebrews 13. Come on. Let's do that. 13.1. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers and doing so. For by doing so, some people will have, will have, sorry, have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves are suffering. Verse 4, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure, pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with whatever you have because God has said, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Remember your leaders, verse 7, who speak the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial foods, which is of no benefit to those who do so. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gates to make the people holy through his own blood. Verse 13, let us therefore, let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. For for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy and not a burden, a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. Many people believe this is the Apostle Paul that wrote, that wrote uh, the, 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 the book of Hebrews. And uh, if you look at his language and a lot of the stuff that comes out of that, many believe, people believe that, that, that he did and so do I. But here's the thing. Hebrews 13 right there is packed with a lot of revelation. 
And loving the bride of Christ, as I said last week, is I am convinced is a, is a, a revelation that the Holy Spirit is going to use in these last days to energize us and cause us to be able to do the work that he's called us to do. It is a massive, massive revelation. If we could just understand and just get this thing, that how important it is to love the bride of Christ. Amen? Amen. You know that Jesus says, and if you look at, if you look at uh, so, some of what he said and also what Paul said, the bride of Christ, what Jesus in my relationship or your relationship with, the, with the Jesus is an analogous to the, to, the, to the relationship that a husband has with his wife. Not so? And how important it is for you, if you're a married man, to love your bride. How important is it? Is it important for your marriage to love your bride? There's like three people that believe that. And all the men that are married are like, uh. I'm going to ask the question again. If you're married, is it important that you love your wife. Alrighty. It's a, it's a, it's a no-brainer. Of course. It, of course it, Craig. Exactly. If I'm a married man, if I love my wife, I am gonna, I'm going to look after, I'm going to do whatever I can to bring her into a beautiful, beautiful place. Amen? Because I love her and I want what's best for her. Likewise, if the wife loves the husband, it's the same thing. She is going to do what she can in herself and for him. That's whatever's best for him. Amen? Because she absolutely loves him. And if she loves him and if he loves her, they come together and everything that comes out of their union, i.e. children, and any, anything else that gets birthed out of them together is advanced and pressed in forward because of the love that they have for one another. Not so. If they have a business together, they're not just business partners. They are lovers who work together in business. And they love each other. And so that's, those things just go so really so well. Not so. And you have a husband or a wife that fall out of love from each other. Like I said last week, if you can fall in love with your wife, if you fell in love with her, chances are you might fall out of love with her too. Not saying it's wrong to fall in love. I'm just saying... You've got to balance that with falling out of love. Amen? Love is a verb. Love is an action. Love is a doing thing. And love is not easy when it gets tested. Oh, Craig, if you love someone, even it gets tested. Yeah, but that love gets tested. Amen? If you've been married for six months, it's fine. Give it six years. Give it 16 years. Amen? Things get better because you start to realize, hey, She's not the doffy, I am. <laughs> Amen? So loving the bride is very important for the work that we have to do with one another. How we actually operate with each other. Loving each other is very, very, very important. If we don't love each other, if we don't understand what that means, we will, we will struggle to come together to do the work that Jesus has called us to do. Amen? Any small thing that comes up is going to trip us up in our understanding because we are just, we don't, there's not this innate love that I have for the next person next to me. And so there were three points in this, in this preach, in this series. Number one is loving those that you know, your brothers and sisters. Please go to YouTube, go down the, download the message and listen to it. It's very important, a very important part of this, of this message. Number two, loving, accepting or being hospitable to those that I don't know or strangers. Those we don't know. So loving those that we know, our brothers and sisters, those that we know, and also loving or being hospitable and accepting those that we don't know. Amen. And I'm going to talk on something this morning, and I wish I had more time. I don't know what I'm going to do here, because now those things took up quite a lot of time. And I don't want to talk too fast and just lose everybody, because this is exceptionally important, what I'm saying today. Amen. And the danger of me talking out this stuff it's because I am one. And so now all of a sudden, ah, okay, it's all about you. No. That's why some pastors will get other pastors in to come preach about tithing or finances. Because if I'm talking about finance, because you see, you just want my money. So let me get Joe Bloggs, who leads a church down the road, to come and talk about finances. So then you don't just think that. He's talking about, actually, I'm going to preach out of the Bible. 
Amen. But the leader of the church gets up and he starts going, feeling all weird now because he's going to preach out something, but you're going to, you're going to go, well, it's all about you because you you're trying to sort yourself out. He's like, well, not really. It's in the Word. Amen. But if you know me, I don't really care what people think. <laughs> Amen. Because I'm not here to please you. I'm here to please Jesus. And so if I'm going to please Jesus, I can't be afraid of what man's going to think about me now. Oh, well, I'm out of here because he just wants me also. About, well, what, hey, listen, at the end of the day, grace life is not for everybody. I understand that. And I'm happy about that. And I'm very content and I'm very secure in that. Amen. Just like DCC is not for everybody. And neither is Elam and neither is City Hill. And neither are other churches around. And some people might love Dawn and I, but other people might despise us. That's fine. Some people will love Johnny Krobler, other people will despise him. That's fine. He's content with that. So was Jesus. If you're going to lead in any way, shape, or form, you're going to have people that love you, you have people that want to just crucify you. But it's okay. Because if, you if, if, if you're just going to try and make everybody love you, you're a politician. And God doesn't call us to be politicians. He's called us to be kingdom builders. Amen. So, so here's point number three. It's called trusting your leaders. Out of Hebrews 13. So I love those that I know. I'm acceptable and I'm hospitable and love those that I don't know. And I trust those that lead me. If I can get those three things together, it's like the trifecta. Amen. Now, I'm going to talk about trusting leaders out of Hebrews 13. Now, you see, because you're a leader now, you just want me to trust you. Hey, of course I do. If you can't trust the leadership in the church that you're in, then you shouldn't be in that church. If you don't trust the leaders, specifically the lead person, then you shouldn't be in that church. You are wasting your time. Because that stuff is going to come in you and go straight out the other side. You're not going to actually take anything to heart. Well, I like the people. Yeah, but ultimately, God's called someone to lead that house. Amen. So you want to go somewhere where you trust the leaders. But oftentimes you find that the person has been to different churches and that the issue doesn't lay with the leaders. It actually lays with them. They have a mistrusting, victim, orphan mindset. and They always think everybody's out to get them. Amen. And so they distrust. They're not trusting people. They don't just trust you because they don't really trust you. Why did you say that to me? Why did you look at me like that? Why did you leave me outside? Why did you not say hello? Why did you not do this? Why are you that? Why do you want me to do this? Why? And they just say, those thoughts just go round and round and round in their head. Amen. But as leaders, we have to not worry about that. I like what Craig Rochelle says. He says, if I obsess about what people think about me, then I don't actually hear what the Holy Spirit's saying to me. So as a church, we want to be loving, we want to be kind, we want to be able to lead with passion and kingdom fire. But in the same vein, we're not too worried about what the people think about us. We've got to continue down the path of what God's called us to continue on. Amen? Are you with me? Okay. And I know I'm going to say these words and preach the things and some people are going to leave you upset. They're going to leave you upset. I'm not naive. Mm. He's done it again. Amen? Ultimately, God calls us to build something. You know, if you're going to build something and come up against a bit of resistance because someone doesn't like you and then stop that, then are you doing it for Jesus or for the people? You do it for Jesus. You do it for the King. You do it for God. You're doing it for Him. That's what I love about DCC. He just doesn't give a rip. I love it. I love it. Johnny Krober doesn't care. He will send guys down here with the pamphlets to come invite people to his church. Down the road yeah. I, that's, I love that. He's not worried about what I think. Hey, what does Craig think? He doesn't care. He's trying to do something for the kingdom of God. If I'm insecure, if I'm insecure and I have a problem, I'm going to start getting a little bitter with Johnny. Hey, bro, you're encroaching on my territory here. This is my area. You know, Finland's for Jesus, DCC. Hey, I've been in Finland's for the last 10 years. What, have I not brought Jesus to the Finland's? Listen, Finland's for Jesus. Come on. We need a whole lot of lighthouses. Amen. I don't know if you realize, but ships are crashing into the, into the rocks often. 
We need more light. That's what I love about that man. He just doesn't care. And there's chances are we, we had a bit of a discussion with him just a little while ago, Dawn and I. And is we gonna is we're looking to do some stuff together. But I, honestly, as leader, we just can't care. We just yeah, hook up and keep going forward. Amen. In everything that we do. Satan's going to come in my marriage. It's an issue. I'm sure Satan's going to come and try and trip you up. Oh, look at this. You, no, no, no. I am going to keep moving forward. Nothing is going to stop me. Amen. A family come around. Oh, you shouldn't do it. I actually know. I'm holding what the word says. I'm going to keep going forward. Well, if you keep loving him, he's going to keep using you. And, no, 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 no. No, that's worldly thinking. I'm going to keep going forward. Amen. So trust in your leaders. Hebrews 13, 7 says, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, forever. Don't you think the writer of Hebrews right there, or Paul, just has some sort of outburst? Like, consider, and it's all of a sudden, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Like, why would he suddenly say that? If you keep reading, then he carries on again. There's a whole lot of practical things that he's giving here from, from Hebrews. I mean, he goes, don't forget to show hospitality. Love people. Remember people in prison. Um, uh, uh, um, Honor marriage. And he just, so he's giving us all these practical things that we, we need to be doing as sons and daughters of, the, of God. And then he says, verse 7, remember. Well, then he says about finances. Don't worry about finances. You know, we've always said, God will never leave me or forsake me. You know, the context is money right there. Because he's saying, be content with what you have. So he throws finances. He says, be content. Be content. Actually, I'm happy with what I have. Of course, I, I want to keep working hard and be a, be a man of, of good work, work integrity. But I'm happy. I'm content. And he says, God will never leave you nor forsake you. Then he says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So I want, I want to say this, as I said last week, that, that, that phrase there, remember your leaders, remember your leaders. How many people in the body of Christ, if you think about it, they're Christians, they, they, they're believers, they have no leaders. There's some people that don't want leaders. They might have been hurt by leadership. And of course, there's some things that you do that can be doff, but you've got to work it through and work it out. Amen. Remember your leaders. They have no leaders. They are leaderless. They don't understand the importance of a mentor and a coach and a leader in their life. And the Bible is full of that. God always calls a man or a woman. Often he calls a person and he says, I'm going to put you in place and you're going to begin. You're going to start something. You go look at the Garden of Eden. Adam. All the way down. Abraham. David. You think about these men, just ongoing. Uh, 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 um, what's his name in the in the threshing floor? The what's his name? Uh, that dude. Simeon, Simon, Simeon. No, um, help me, people. That was in the threshing. The angel appeared to him. Mighty man of God. Gideon, or Gideon, if you're Afrikaans. Gideon. So God uses someone. He always uses someone right down to Paul the Apostle. Right down to Jesus. He uses somebody that will be a catalyst to starting something. Amen. So that person then becomes, God begins to use him as a leader to begin to institute and start a process as he gets more and more leaders around him. But those leaders don't disappear. They always stay there. Amen. Even if they're working with someone... I know a man, his name is Paul Tottle, someone that I, I, I reference often. He's, a, he's a, um, a barrister in Adelaide, one of the top barristers in Adelaide. Not barrister, barrister. He's a proper Aussie. He's coming to, to Grace Life at the end of this year. As a matter of fact, you've got Ryan Matthews coming next month. And Paul's, Paul's coming. And so, and Ryan, both these men, I honor and I love them. Ryan, I've known since 1999 at Glenridge. Now, I've been on eldership at different churches. We've planted a church. We're leading a church. But I still see Ryan as, an eld, as a leader in my life. Even though it's been 20 years now. Because he's gone 20 years ahead of me. Amen. He didn't stagnate. He's just, 
I met now all of a sudden now him and I are peers and now I'm going to tell you how to do things. No, he's still leading me because he's 20 years still ahead of me. And in 20 years time, you'll be another 20 years ahead of me. I'll still be referencing him. Amen. See, remember your leaders. That word your, that means you've got to take it on board. Who are my leaders? I said last week, who are my leaders? If you don't have leaders, you need them. I'm not just some ethereal bunch of people out there that kind of lead some, some group you with. I'm talking about a, 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 a leader that you know that has access to your life and can talk and chat and be involved with you. Amen. Someone you can reference and talk to. Amen. Uncle Ryan had my phone, Jazz, just so you know. Love you. So you need to be able to say that. Who is your leader? You know, the more successful you become, the more you need a leader, the more you need a coach. You, you, you have top, top mixed martial artists or, or boxers, top of the crop, professionals, champions. Does he just walk into the cage, into the, into the boxing ring on his own? <laughs> Who comes with him? And then when he takes the mark and he's giving credit of the uh, oh, Chaslan bleeding, but he's won. He's like, yeah, hey, I did so well. Hey, I just thought about this and I thought about that and I thought about this and, and hey, I'm so glad I won. Woo-hoo! What does he generally do? He gives credit to his coach and his team around him. And it's like, I want to thank, thank you to my coach. Hey, hey, what's it for you? I, I went, Adrian! You know, I just said, Adrian, if you're only, only if you're over probably 30 or 40, you'll remember that one. Rocky Balboa. But the, 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 the point is, they've got coaches, and the coaches are, are, are helping them. And you'd think the guy would go like, hey, listen, I'm a professional. I'm getting my face beaten in here. I know what I'm doing. I don't need you to be telling me how to box. But he's got a jiu-jitsu coach. He's got a wrestling coach. If he's a professional mixed martial artist in America, he's got a, um, perhaps here too, he's got a, um, he's got a boxing coach. Amen? They're all on the pay slip. They're all getting, they're all part of his team. They're all coaching him. And you, that's because the, 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 the more, the higher and higher up the road you go, the more you need that. Amen? The deeper down the road, the, the higher up in the kingdom, the more, the more you start advancing and pushing and the more you realize, I need coaches. I need a leader. You know, to press into the, big, the biggest leader with a capital L called Jesus. But he's going to always push you out and say, not push you out, push you away. He pulls you in, but he's going he's gonna to direct you to men and women who are at walking far in the kingdom so that you can grab hold of their coats, their, their, their shirts and say, take me with you. Amen. Amen. It's men and women that open doors for you. Oh, God is the one who opens the doors. Yeah, but God's the one who turns the hearts. Amen? I love what Bill Johnson says. Bill Johnson says from Bethel, you know, who knows who Bill Johnson is? And Bill Johnson says this. He says, unless I can see that you're willing to outwork my vision, don't come and tell me about yours. That's Bill Johnson. Amen? Bethel, you know, they've got... Just a supernatural school of ministry of a thousand ch- uh, uh, kids. Not kids, a thousand people rather. Amen. So, so it's just a case of we need a leader, someone that we can grip and say, speak into my life. Help me. Help me. And pride, pride, pride stops us from doing that because I know better. Where's my daughter? She's in the back room. She's 14. Don't try and tell her how to do something. Because she knows better. Now I've sat down and said, Jazzy, listen to my baby. I'm 50. I was 36 when you were born. 36 years old. How much living had I done before you were even born? Now you're 14 and trying to tell me how to do things. Now you're 14, I'm trying to give you direction and you're flat out refusing it because you know better. You are wrong, my girl. See, it's pride in us that stops us from wanting to learn because I go, I don't need anybody. It's just me and myself. I'm a loner and I'm a, I just do my own thing. 
It's immaturity. It's pride and immaturity. Amen. Maturity and a humble heart comes and says, teach me. Show me the way. How do I go? How do I walk this road? I need you to help me. Amen. And leadership is not there to control. I'm I'm jumping ahead and I'm definitely not going to finish. So we're going to do a part three. Everyone's like, oh my God. Come on. Dawn took so long on the tithes and offerings. I am keen to preach this. Now I've also got to wait a whole week. Should I just finish? Guys, say. Okay. Point number one, quickly. I am not going to do point number one quickly. <laughs> if it, with, with, without leadership, we struggle. You, you, you think about you think about this world. Think about this country, even. And I've told people they miff about South Africa. I said, listen, we've had ten dark years, ten years of bad leadership in this country. Bad leadership, man. Now, of course, the people that are leading are all politicians, so that's already hamstrung them. But if you have good, that's, I, let me tell you now, I'll tell this from the front, I love Donald Trump. I, I, I don't care what people think. I, I dig him. Why? Because he's a good, he just leads. He doesn't care what people think. He's not a politician. He's not trying to keep everybody happy. Everybody happy. He is just, he just leads, man. He just goes, I'm just, I'm just, I'm leading. If you want to follow me, follow me. And can I tell you something? The American people are beginning to be in, in armored with them. They're starting to go, we want a man who's, who's going to lead us. Who's not yellow, belly livid and yellow and just and trying to do everything that everybody else wants him to do. He just, he just doesn't care. He just goes for it. Amen. Is everything you say correct? Well, I don't know. I'm not in his office every day. But I just know that the world needs leaders like him. Jesus is raising up an army of leaders, friends, who don't care what people think about them. They don't care about what you say. They're not obsessed by all the negativity around them. They're not obsessed with all the people skinnering about how bad they think that he, they are. They're not obsessed with that. They don't care. Their ears are closed to it. It's like the Holy Spirit just closes their ears. Maybe I'm just too doff to think all that stuff. But I just go, I don't care what people think. I just want to lead and do what God's called me to do. Amen. And the Lord will add to my number the people he's going to add to my number. Amen. And then people will, will move on. Ali, around for 10 years, a decade, and he moves on. We pray him out. It's beautiful. There's tears, there's hugs, and off he goes. I, I have no problem with God moving people around because sometimes people change jobs or change cities or whatever. But we just keep moving forward. Amen. And God will just keep adding. Someone said the other day, oh, someone's left. They're all a bitter, you know. They, and, they, and, and I said, you know what? We, we only got space for probably 200 people, 180 in this hall if you start putting beanbags out. Amen. All the leaders are going to sit on beanbags out. You. But John with his hip is in need, having need a camp chair. And I'm so, I go, hey, you know what? At the end of the day, I, I would rather have people that are here, that are amped, that are keen, that are saying, let's move, let's go forward, let's press, let's do what God's called to so do. Craig and Dawn and leaders, we're behind you guys. And someone who's sitting here going, I don't trust that person. I don't like that person. They did something other I don't, you know, and they're just ongoing for weeks and weeks and months and months. Why are you just going to drag us down? Amen. I don't mean I don't love you. And I want you to, I want you to stay, I want you to change. Amen. But if you really cannot, then rather leave the seat for someone else. Amen. Please, please, I'm trying to be pastoral here. All right. Trying to mix this up with some pastoral juices. It's just, we just got to be real, man. And it's, it's, it's just, let 2020, 
You know, if you deal with bitterness and you deal with, uh, with, then you want to overcome that. It's very unhealthy for you to be living there. Very unhealthy. I am not living there. Neither is my wife. We could have been bitter tw- 10 years ago because stuff that we went through, 12, 13 years ago, we went through some horrible stuff and how we were treated by some leaders that was actually factually not so good for Dawn and I and what actually happened. But you know what? We, we my ultimately... Bitterness just kills you. Bitterness kills your, your, your destiny. It kills your destiny because you can't hear God while you're bitter. Aubrey said something to you the other day. I thought it was brilliant. I don't even know whose it was. He said, you cannot carry an offense and carry the cross at the same time. You just can't. Amen? And the problem is if you're bitter with the leadership or you don't trust the leadership, you're going to be withholding in your time, you're going to be withholding your talents, and you're going to be withholding in your treasure. And that's not what the Holy Spirit wants from you. Amen? So good leadership, you know what good leadership does? It forces out toxic things. Good leadership forces out toxic people and toxic things in in a a place. So Ali has just started a new job. He's telling me on Wednesday, not a new job, same company, but different place. And he says, and, and in that place, there's a lot of stuff happening that's not supposed to be happening. Not corruption, this guy's not doing right things and not doing things that they should be doing. And so it's almost like they've said, okay, they're great, we're going to send you there. Because he knows actually he's going to come in, not with a big stick, but who Alan Hermit is. And begin to just bring change. And what's going to happen? It's going to flush out some of the people that just not, are not lacquer. I mean, that's what good leadership does. Now we understand that they crucified Jesus, but that was part of the plan. They didn't shut his mouth, but he flushed out the bad stuff. Amen. And he started something that was pretty incredible called the church. And so we take our cue from Jesus and we speak the truth of God and we speak to each other truth in love. Of course, someone who's bitter or offended or carrying a, 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 um, something in, the, in their hearts, anytime you speak about them, speak to them about anything, they're going to think that you're trying to hammer them, which is not the case. Amen? But we need to be good leaders. The church needs strong leadership. The world, we need strong leaders who are going to lead with the fire of God. They're going to lead with, with, with the heart of a lion. They're going to lead with the fire of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And not be put off by what people say. And I want to encourage you, let your leadership be that this year. Let your words be that this year. Begin to make decisions that are going to impact your life in a positive way. I'm going to do part three next week, okay? Are you happy with that? Because I I don't want to mess this up. And you're going to love this stuff. You might might, might have not even heard any of this stuff before. I want to encourage you to come and listen. Invite your friends. Some of your friends need to understand what good leadership is and what good leadership is not. Amen. And, uh, um, And again... 2020, let that be the year. It's been my prayer all the time that God would, would uh, um, strengthen us and strengthen our resolve for where he's taking us. That uh, if there's bitterness and offense, he would bring it up to the fore. It would get flushed out. Amen. Yes, babe? Okay. I just thought of two scenarios I'd love to share. In terms of leadership, leadership opens the way. So the other day we were leaving the gym. It's situated at Grosvenor Boys High School. So we came to the gate and there was a guy standing there and he was really looking lost. He was locked in and he had no way to get out. And he was kind of like aimlessly bewildered looking around. So Craig kind of drove up and took out his remote and opened the gate and we watched his expression. And he was like, oh, delighted. And uh, Craig still joked and said, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And we had a little joke together and he was, oh, thank you so much. And he walked out. But leadership sometimes does that where it opens the gate where it's impossible for you to open it for yourself. But arrogance causes a person to go, I wasn't waiting for the gate to open. I'm actually just, I'm waiting here for someone. I'm doing something else. And you can actually stand there and be arrogant enough to allow that gate to close, the leader to go out, having opened the way for you and allowing it to close, but because there's so much pride and arrogance, Mm. you cut your nose to spite your face and not go, I'm going to be humble enough to say, you actually made the way for me. You actually opened it. I'm actually going to take this gap because that's actually where I want to be going. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be confined. And there are people who are imprisoned in their lives and their mindsets, stinking thinking, where they are bound there because they're just too pride, full of pride and arrogance to actually say, you've actually opened the way for me. I'm going to follow on. 
one and, and, and take a gap. And then the second thing that I was thinking about, and I knew God was going to speak through it, we've got a broken fridge at the moment. It has been very frustrating in all of this heat. Obviously, everything is just, it is just failing us dismally. The freezer is working. It's going like a Boeing. Um, but So we keep putting ice packs into the top, but the fridge is not working. So we, we got some... Um, uh, uh, guidance of a uh, suggestion of what we could do is defrost the whole thing, let it for 48 hours or something. So we open everything. But I looked at it this morning and I, just, I knew God wanted to say something through it. And it's like when we receive something like this, we can take it in and we can be, I'd like to say on fire for the Lord, but that's an oxymoron. But we want to be able to preserve what we hear so that it never goes sour. We have been struggling. We're now on box milk. But you know, it's like what, you, what happens is if you're not operating, if you're not being spirit led, if you're not plugged in, if you're not operating at, the, operating at the optimum level that you're meant to be operating at, when you receive something and there's bitterness and there's, and there's something happening that's not so cool, um, that, that stuff is going to go sour inside that thing. And that's what we want to be, just we want to say, God, just search my heart, God. Search my heart. Help me flush those things out that I'm operating at an optimum level. That when I hear a truth, I receive it and I preserve it so that when someone comes and eats from my life, they get something that's fresh and it's not stale or sour or off or warm from a fridge. So Amen. those are my two now. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Alrighty, so part three next week. I want to encourage you to see there's a whole lot of chairs here empty. Let's invite our friends. We've got, actually got some more chairs around. We can pack more chairs out. I want to encourage you, invite your family, invite your friends. It's an important revelation that we understand. Amen? And uh, I'm, I'm convinced it'll change the way you see leadership. Alrighty. Bless you guys. Have a great week. And um, we will see you soon. Remember the life groups this week? Life groups are starting. Please chat to the guys. They'll have, you'll have this pamphlet at the back. Grab one. Take a look at it. Pray about it if you want. And um, say again. Bless you guys. Have a great week. And we'll see you next week. Next week, Sunday.